Good morning, and welcome to The Peorian. I'm your host, Paul Gordon. Election Day 2012, a day which many people probably thought would never get here, is now upon us. We will be electing the 45th President of the United States. The question is, will it be the same as our 44th President, Barack Obama, or will it be the Republican challenger, Mitt Romney? What a campaign it's been, huh? Well, it just seems like yesterday that Romney was one of a dozen candidates for the GOP nomination. No, it doesn't. It seems like it was years ago. But with a presidential campaign where veracity seemed to be wanting on both sides of the fence and sound bites ruled the airwaves, it may have been easy for some people to forget that there were state and local races happening as well. It's just been in the last few weeks that advertising for those races have become the norm. We have some interesting local races this year, including the 17th congressional seat and, of course, the state senate race between Dave Kaler and Pat Sullivan. My guest today is Brad McMillan, executive director of the Institute for Principled Leadership and Public Service. We'll discuss those races and look ahead a few years when we come back. Welcome back to The Peorian. My guest today is Brad McMillan. Executive Director of the Institute for Principled Leadership in Public Service at Bradley University. Welcome, Brad, and thanks for being here today. Glad to be here, Paul. The first thing I need to do is to point out to our viewers that our show is recorded well in advance, and therefore we won't have the latest polling information or results from the latest debates. But, Brad, can you give us your opinion about how the presidential campaign has gone? Well, uh before the first debate, uh, it, it looked like Obama uh, had a, a clear lead, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, in the swing states. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, after uh, Romney's strong performance uh, in the first debate, uh, you saw the national polls uh, get very close, uh, and you also uh, saw uh, Governor Romney uh, starting to close the gap uh, in a lot of the key states like Florida, Virginia, Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so ultimately, uh, I think it's going to be a very close uh, presidential race. Did it surprise you that one debate could make that much of a difference when people looked at style more than anything else? Well, uh, you know, I think it was surprising you know, not only how strong Romney came out, uh, but how weak the president was in the first debate. Uh, most people think of President Obama as being uh, pretty strong uh, as far as his uh, charisma and his oral skills, and that, and that first debate, I think, surprised a lot of people. Uh, you know, the Pew Research uh, poll that came out after the first debate showed that uh, three out of four Americans uh, thought that Romney clearly had won uh, that first debate. So it was a big shift that occurred. Does that make the pres vice presidential debate more important, or do you think it'll make much difference? This is recorded right before the vice presidential debate. Well, you know, I think it will make a difference. I think in, I think in any tight race, uh, any uh, piece of the puzzle uh, can, can make a difference. And so, uh, I think it probably elevates the importance of the vice presidential debate uh, since the race has tightened up. In my opening monologue, I noted that this campaign hasn't exactly been known for its veracity on either side. Has it been uglier than usual this time around? Well, I think it has been uglier. And uh, I think the main reason uh, is because of the Supreme Court uh, decision in Citizens United which has allowed uh, the formation of all these super PACs uh, to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, on campaign ads. And almost all of them on both sides are negative. Mm -hmm. Your organization shows that by its very nature, you look at integrity when it comes to politics. So has this presidential race just bothered you the way it's gone? Oh, it really has. Uh, you know, the Institute at Bradley seeks to promote bipartisanship, mm -hmm. civility, high ethics in government. 
And uh, unfortunately, uh, this election has turned very ugly, uh, and uh, it really hasn't been about a lot about substance, uh, and uh, so it has been disappointing. What have been the key issues in this race? What, what have been and what should be the key issues, in your opinion? Well, you know, I think, I think for most Americans, uh, the economy, uh, jobs, uh, how can they uh, do better by their family, mm -hmm. uh, pay their mortgage, uh, afford gas at the gas pump. I mean, uh, you know, I think those are, uh, but I don't, I don't see much significant debate on uh, what is a long-term energy strategy for America so that we can relieve our reliance on uh, foreign oil uh, and hopefully bring down um, you know, gas prices uh, over the long term. I don't see uh, much really substantive debate on what do we do about our national debt and deficit crisis and how are we going to get there. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, the 32nd uh, campaign commercial sound bites don't lend t to too much substance. Yeah. Uh, the debates do a little bit better job, uh, but uh, it's been a disappointing campaign. Even when they bring up some subjects, the candidates, both of them, have lacked telling us what they would do. The only thing they've said is that they don't like something or that they would do it differently, but they're not exactly giving us details on what they would do. I couldn't agree more, Paul. And, you know, I, I think the voters deserve those details and they've been far and, and, and few between. You know, the other thing that I uh, have said quite often this election season is that the most important question that I think voters should ask themselves is which presidential candidate can do the best job of leading given the fact that there will be a divided Congress. Yes. Uh, because if you don't have the ability uh, to uh, move forward public policy given the divided nature of Congress, then you're not going to be very effective. And the gridlock is going to happen, and not much is going to happen. Before we go to break, care to predict a winner in a presidential race? Uh, too close to call right now. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to talk about other races that Peoria area voters are following. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Peorian. I'm with Brad McMillan, Executive Director of the Institute for Principled Leadership and Public Service. Before we go further, Brad, could you tell our viewers what is the Institute for Principled Leadership? We are uh, at Bradley University trying to develop a new crop of ethical, bipartisan, civil leaders. And uh, what we do is we focus on the undergraduate students at Bradley, uh, we teach courses under the leadership minor. We have national public policy symposiums on the big issues of the day. We bring in national state speakers. Uh, our foundation is based on uh, public servants like Bob Michael, mm -hmm. uh, Ray LaHood, Aaron Schock, who are all Bradley uh, University alums. Uh, we believe that the country uh, and the state would uh, do a lot better if they followed uh, their leadership approach and style uh, than what we've seen uh, at the national and state levels. The races that we seem to hear about most locally are for the 17th congressional seat between incumbent Bobby Schilling and challenger Sherry Bustos, the Democrat, and for the state senate seat between incumbent Dave Kaler and, and Republican challenger Pat Sullivan. Would you agree that those are probably the, more, the most significant local races this year? Absolutely. Uh, you know, this is the first time that uh, Peoria is going to be split into two different 
uh, congressional mm -hmm. uh, districts. Uh, actually, Bradley University will now be represented by whoever the uh, 17th district member of Congress uh, is. So I we're very, uh, we're watching that very closely. Uh, I've had both uh, uh, Congressman Schilling visit me at the Institute and uh, Challenger Sherry Bustos uh, visit me at the Institute. So, um, you know, that that's going to be a very key race. It's it's picked as the eighth hottest congressional race in the country. No kidding. Uh, and uh, so there'll be a lot of national attention on uh, who wins that race. Do you worry that since most of the 17th district is kind of concentrated in the Quad Cities area, is the Peoria area going to get short shrift? Absolutely not. You know, actually, I, I believe that having two members of Congress can benefit the Peoria region uh, in many ways. Uh, you'll have you'll have two uh, members that you can go to uh, if you have an issue uh, or a project. And uh, I, I actually believe um, that there might be some benefits uh, to having uh, two representatives in Congress serve the Peoria area. It'll be imperative that they be able to work together, won't it? Absolutely. You know, but we have a. We have a great history of that, Paul, uh, in the Peoria region uh, of our federal uh, and state and local uh, public leaders working together across party lines for uh, the good of the area. And uh, we're very hopeful that whoever wins uh, will continue that tradition uh, in the future. In the state Senate seat, Dave Kater's state Senate seat, we're hearing something you don't often hear in a state race, and that is political insider accusations. Uh, Pat Sullivan is saying that, you know, Dave Kidder's been there too long. It's time for change. What are the key issues in that race? Is it the state budget? Well, you know, obviously, uh, Illinois has very significant issues that they're dealing with. Uh, there's the, the pension reform that absolutely has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're uh, reaching a very critical point uh, that, um, and so uh, we, can't, we can't avoid these issues uh, any longer. And, uh, and I think the state budget, uh, getting that uh, in balance uh, is, is important. Uh, what do we do to um, attract business investment uh, in, in the state of Illinois uh, is, is a key issue. And so, um, you know, an awful lot of money and, and energy uh, is being put into that Senate race. Yes, I've noticed. And this year, it's not so much an advantage to be an incumbent, is it? Uh, not an advantage uh, to be an incumbent, uh, but the district does lean uh, Democratic. Yes. We're going to break now, and when we come back, we'll look ahead a little bit, perhaps even at the next gubernatorial race and even the 2016 presidential race. But first, here's our own Kevin Kaiser to tell us what's happening in literature. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome to me. This week, it's another episode of Kevin Read Stuff So You Don't Have To, Fatwa Edition. And today, I'm going to take a look at Salman Rushdie's new memoir, Joseph Anton. Joseph Anton is Rushdie's long-awaited autobiography and details how his life changed on February 14, 1989. That was the day when many of us in the Western world first learned the meaning of the word fatwa. On that day, the Ayatollah Khomeini sentenced Rushdie to death for his novel Satanic Verses, which was accused of being against Islam, the Prophet, and the Quran. Rushdie writes about how his life changed in an instant, forcing him to go underground, moving from house to house, with the constant protection of an armed police force. This constant state of fear, even though it abated as time went on, lasted for over a decade. The title of the book is the alias he was asked to give the police and is the combination of the first names of two writers he loves, Joseph Conrad and Anton Chekhov. This is a frank memoir in which Rushdie grapples with trying to live his life under constant threat, along with the grim and sometimes comic realities of living with armed policemen, as well as the close bond he's formed with them. In fact, the official report on Rushdie, in all its coded glories entitled, Assessment of Strength and Potential of Dotterill Protest Against Godwit of Arctic Turns Pigeon and Implications for Golden Plover. Dotterill was the Muslims, Godwit was the publisher, Golden Plover was the parent company, Pigeon was the book he wrote, and Arctic Turn, the author himself. 
The book is an astonishing look into what was the first act of a drama that is still unfolding somewhere in the world every day. And the fact that Rushdie has regained his freedom and continues to write great novels is a testament to his will and those who supported him, including the British government, his publishers, journalists, and fellow writers. So there you have it, another exciting and mini fresh episode of Kevin Reed's Stuff So You Don't Have To, Fatwa Edition. But you know, Rushdie's memoir is just the beginning when it comes to books about writers, with over a dozen titles coming out in the next six months on people like Sylvia Plath, H.L. Mencken, Edward Said, Thornton Wilder, Daniel Steele, Franz Kafka, Agatha Christie, Charles Dickens, Shelley, and P.G. Wodehouse. And there's not one, not two, not three, but four books about Hemingway being published, including To Have and Have Another, which is about the author's notorious drinking habits. To top it off, there's even a new book coming out about Central Illinois native David Foster Wallace called David Foster Wallace, The Last Interview and Other Conversation. That book will be published December 18th of this year, just in time for Christmas. It just goes to show that sometimes it's just as interesting to read about great authors as it is to read their works. So that's it for me this week, so you can go now. Welcome back to The Peorian. I'm with Brad McMillan of the Institute for principal leadership in public service. So Brad, we're two days before the election and already the pundits are talking about 2016 and who the likely front runners will be. <laughs> and obviously that depends on who wins. Absolutely, <laughs> sure. Does it surprise you though that they're already talking about it? Oh, you know, people are always uh, trying to, you know, look into the crystal ball, you know, several years out and, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's name, you know, continually sure. gets uh, thrown thrown back out, uh, and uh, if uh, President Obama wins re-election, you know, I, I don't know whether she'll uh, be tempted to uh, throw her hat in the ring or not. If she does, some people have said that she would probably resign as Secretary of State a couple years in. I think she'd have to. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, running for president is... Uh, takes an enormous amount of time and energy, and, yeah. and she would probably need to step aside as Secretary of State and, and focus on her campaign. Has she been an effective Secretary of State, in your opinion? I do believe she has. Uh, you know, I think uh, she, uh, she's been everywhere, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I think, I mean, she's incredibly smart. Uh, she's very thoughtful. She does her homework. Um, and. Uh, you know, I think part of what you want in a Secretary of State is not to make international waves, and I don't think she's made too many international waves, uh, so uh, I'd, I'd give her pretty high marks. If President Obama wins re-election, who do you think the front-runner would be for the Republican nomination in 2016? Some people say that Paul Ryan is going to be a vice presidential candidate who never becomes president. Do you agree with that necessarily? Oh, I don't know. Paul Ryan is a very impressive uh, candidate. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to hear uh, Congressman Ryan in person many times uh, at Congressman Shock's fly-ins. Uh, uh, he's very, very thoughtful, uh, really knows the public policy issues uh, very well. Uh, he's a big idea guy. Uh, and he's able to present them in a way uh, that uh, persuades people uh, rather than turns them off. So I, I think he might. I think he might be somebody to watch as well. I think Rick Santorum would probably make another run at yeah, it. Yeah, no, he you know he did a, a very commendable job uh, in the Republican primaries uh, this time around. Uh, he he would have a base of supporters uh, to build from. So. I would say that he would he would be a likely candidate as well. And if he loses, this is probably Mitt Romney's final campaign. Yeah, I would think so. Let's turn a little bit more local. There's rumors swirling around that Aaron Schock is considering a run for governor. Have you heard it? I have. Do you think it's true? Uh, I think there's a, uh, a pretty good chance that uh, Congressman Schock will uh, uh, will look seriously uh, at running for governor. Uh, something that uh, he'll he'll have to decide quickly uh, after the election uh, whether he's going to step forward. Uh, you have to raise an enormous amount of money, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but uh, I I think there's a there's a good chance 
that Congressman Chuck will, will run for Illinois governor. Could he win? Oh, I think he could. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Congressman Chuck has shown his ability uh, to raise uh, a lot of money, yeah. which uh, is uh, a lot of uh, what campaigns uh, are about. Uh, I also think he's very articulate. Uh, he, he would be viewed as a bold new leader uh, that um, probably doesn't have some of the baggage of being tied to Springfield. He could almost run as an outsider uh, rather than an insider uh, to Springfield at this point. Okay. That's going to be interesting to watch. See if he it'll, it'll, it'll be, and then there'll be a lot of other dominoes that oh, will yeah. fall if uh, Congressman Chuck runs for governor. So, Thank you, Brad. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I'm quite sure it didn't help you with your voting decisions, but that wasn't the intent either. Maybe we've got you thinking ahead a little bit, though, huh? Remember, you can see today's show in its entirety on our website, thepeorian.com, following this broadcast. And you can go to our website to catch a little extra discussion between Brad and myself. And be sure to join us next week here on WHOI-TV and on our website. Have a good week. Thank <laughs> you.